I've been married long enough now where it is difficult for me to remember a time prior to being married. And every year that goes by, I get a little further down that path of, of remembering a time before marriage. And I can foresee a time when I might question whether there actually was a premarital stage in my life. But my marriage did have a very definite and clear beginning. It was a day over 16 years ago when I asked Krista to be my wife and she said yes and uh, we made vows to one another. When we look at the people of Israel and God's covenant with Israel, sometimes I think we also forget that there was a pre-Israel period in the scripture. And the reason we struggle with that, maybe even subconsciously, is because the vast majority of the greatest chunk of the Old Testament is centered on and, and concerning the nation of Israel. Exodus, all the way through Malachi, with the exception of the book of Job, deals with the Jewish people and God's relationship with the Jewish people. But we must keep in our mind that Adam was not a Jew, nor was Noah a Jew. Even Abraham was not a Jew. He was the father of the Jews, but it wasn't until his grandson Jacob came along that the Jewish nation was formed. There was a very definite beginning to God's relationship with the people of Israel. Now, when I got married, it started with the engagement period. And many years ago on my birthday in March, this, the year was 1992, I took Krista by one hand and held my guitar in another, and I led her through the streets of downtown St. Louis, along the sidewalks to the foregrounds of the Gateway Arch. And there, on a grassy place, I asked her to sit down and close her eyes, and I got out my guitar, and I began to sing a song that I had written. And in the middle of this song, I had a very dramatic pause, long enough for me to set my guitar aside, reach in my case, and pull out the, whole, the case for the ring, and get on my knee and sing to her. I won't repeat it for you. Sing to her the question, will you marry me. And to my everlasting delight, she opened her eyes and said, yes. And then less than five months later, we came to a church, invited all of our family and friends, and we took our vows to one another, pledging our loyalty in the covenant of marriage till death do us part. That was the beginning of my marriage relationship with my wife, Krista. Do you know that the nation of Israel, in their relationship with God, had an engagement day and a wedding day? Similar to what those of you who are married experience, similar to what I just described. And we find the record of the engagement day in the 19th chapter of Exodus. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Exodus, you know the stories that at the end of Genesis, the Israelites are a clan of 70 people. But then we turn the page to the first chapter of Exodus and we find that over 400 years have passed and now the nation of Israel has become so large that the king of Egypt is concerned that they might overthrow him. And so he decides in his mind that the best course of action at this point is to treat them so harshly and place such a burden on them that they will be uh, resistant to rebelling against him. Well, they can only tolerate this for so long and they cry out to God for deliverance and God hears their request and he raises up Moses to deliver the people of Israel out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and he does so with a scourge of plagues that leaves Pharaoh's head spinning. After the final plague, the killing of the firstborn sons through all Egypt, Pharaoh says, go, get out of here. And the Israelites leave. And we're all familiar with that story. And God led them through Moses into the wilderness at Sinai. And it was in that place where God proposed to Israel. And we pick up in chapter 19 of Exodus 
in verse 5, and it reads like this. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This was God's pledge to the nation of Israel. And if you notice there, there were three specific aspects to the relationship God would have with Israel that make them a special people to him. The first one is, he says, you will be a people from my own possession. Now, God is not suggesting here that Israel belonged to somebody else, but now, once they enter into this relationship, they will belong to him. That's not the point. In fact, he makes that clear because he says, all of the earth is already mine. He's talking about a special, particular relationship that they would have. We use this kind of terminology. Strictly speaking, my house is my house and not my children's house. I'm the homeowner. I'm the one that pays the mortgage every month. I'm the one that will be in default if the loan goes uh, bad, not my children. But even though, strictly speaking, every bedroom, for instance, or every bathroom or uh, living room or dining room, all those rooms are mine, my children speak of their room and their bathroom because those are special places to them. And we understand how that terminology works. I have a room. It's my study. In there I keep my guitars, and I keep my baseball cards, and I keep my books, and there's my desk, and I can go in there once in a while and close the door and have some peace and quiet in a home with three young children. And I call that my room. Now again, they're all my rooms. But when I talk about my room, my kids know what I'm speaking of. That's my special room. I have a special relationship, a special love for that room. And so when I talk about it being my room, everybody understands what I mean. I don't say I, that's my, my uh, living room or my dining room. And I certainly don't say it's my kitchen. It's Krista's kitchen. And everybody knows that as well. We have... A, an understanding of what it means to use the personal uh, pronoun, the possessive pronoun, my, in that kind of context. That's what God is talking about here. All the earth is his. Every people group is his. But he says, here's my offer to you, Israel. You can be my special possession, my people in a unique way. Some of your translations say a treasured possession or a special treasure. God holds out to the people of Israel this unique, particular affection that he would have with them. He also says that you will be a kingdom of priests. Now you are probably familiar with the ancient distinction between a prophet and a priest. The prophet, if I can say it, somewhat crudely, brought God to the people and the priest brought the people to God. It was the prerogative of the priests to minister in the manifest presence of God. They did their work in the temple. And one day a year in Israel, the high priest was allowed to actually enter into the presence of God in the, whole, in the most holy place. But the priests did their service in the temple where God dwelt, and they would bring the sacrifices, they would bring the prayers of the people to God in the temple area. That's what made a priest a priest, the fact that he was able to serve close to God. This was kind of like the courtiers in ancient kingdoms, those uh, servants who were able to spend time in the palace near the throne with the king. They had special access to the inner sanctum, you might say. That's what priests had. Well, God here promises Israel they would be an entire kingdom of priests. They would all be able to minister and to serve and to have access to 
the seat of God, the throne of God. This was held out to them as a very special part of the relationship. And then thirdly, he says they would be a holy nation. Now, when we use the word holy, we tend to think quickly of righteousness, of sanctification. But at its root, holy really means set apart or separate or different. What God is saying there to Israel is that he would make Israel different than any other nation, separate and distinct from all of the rest. Similar to the way that I chose Krista and not Susie or Sally to be my wife, and I told her that I would give her my affection for the rest of our life and not anyone else, God held out to Israel that they would be unique in affection with him. He did not choose the Hittites. He did not choose the Canaanites. He did not choose the Babylonians. He said, you will be a holy, separate, distinct nation from all of the others. This was what God proposed to Israel on that day when he brought them out from Egypt, when he offered this relationship to the Israelites at Sinai. Now, did you notice how God presented this to Israel? See, here's how I made my proposal to Krista. I said, I love you. I want to be with you for the rest of my life. Would you be my wife? That was about as far as I went. But imagine if I had said something like this. Krista, I love you, and I want to spend the rest of my life with you, and I want to give you my special affection, and I want to share all of our hopes and dreams together, and I will do that, and I will put a roof over your head, and I will buy you clothes, and flowers, and I will write you love songs, and I will write love poems, and I will do all these wonderful, blessed things, as long as I have exactly the food that I like at exactly the time that I like every day, and all of my pants are ironed where there's not a single wrinkle in them, and all of my shirts are pressed and starched just the way I like them, and there's not a speck of dust anywhere in all of our house. And you bear me 11 stout boys so that I can have my own football team. If you do all of those things, then I would delight to be your husband. I promise you if I had made that proposal, I would not be here talking about my 16 years of marriage today. <laughs> but that is the way God proposed to the Jews. Did you notice how he said it? Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, and so on. Right at the front of God's relationship with the Jews, he puts a condition on it. You will be all of these things if you obey me. If you keep my covenant. Well, what were the terms of the covenant? That's what we pick up in chapter 20, what we know as the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue, the Ten Words. And we know these, do we not? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath and so on. We know the Ten Commandments. Those are the commands that God gave to Israel that he said, you must keep these commandments if you are going to be my special people, my special possession, a holy nation, and a kingdom of priests. Then we look through chapters 21, 22, and 23, and we have what is sometimes called the Book of the Covenant, where these Ten Commandments are expanded and fleshed out, and, and some case uh, situations, what we call casuistic law, is set before them, some real-life examples of how the covenant is to be kept. Those are the terms like pressing my pants or wiping all of the dust 
from our furniture at home, as I used in my example earlier, those are the terms that God set before Israel that they must keep if they are going to be his special people. So how did Israel respond to this? Did they say, look, that doesn't sound like such a great deal to us. Those are pretty hard things to do. No, they accepted God's proposal. They said, I do to God. And we find that recorded in Exodus chapter 24, beginning in verse 3. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. It's almost as if Moses is saying, now, before you rush into this, be sure you understand the terms. And he read to them the Ten Commandments and chapters 21, 22, and 23, rehearsing for them all of the commands, all of the ordinances of God. And he says, this is the covenant into which you are about to enter. Are you sure? And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses sprinkled the blood on the people, sealing in that blood the oath the bond between God and Israel. From that moment forward, Israel was obligated to obey every single jot and tittle in the Ten Commandments and the laws as they were expressed in the subsequent chapters. And God was obligated, if they did keep the law, to bless them with untold blessings. Now there's one word that occurs virtually every time the terms of the covenant are rehearsed for the people of Israel. Generation after generation after generation, as the book of the covenant is read to the sons, to the children of the Jews, there is a word that appears in each case. It is an extremely significant word, though it's only two letters. It's probably the biggest little word in all the scripture. And it's quite easy to pass over the word because it's so small. But there may not be a more important word in the whole Bible. It is the word, if. If, if, if you obey, if you keep the covenant, repeatedly Moses says to the people, if you keep the covenant. I want to read for you a few of the places where this term occurs. And I'm going to read several of them because I want you to understand how frequent this is and how important this word is. In Leviticus chapter 26, again, the Israelites are told the terms of the covenant. And we read, If you walk in my statutes... And keep my covenants so as to carry them out. Then I shall give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Do you hear what Moses is saying or what, what the Bible is saying here to the people of Israel? I will bless you by opening the rain clouds and pouring down water upon your fields and you will have abundant crops. You'll be rich, basically. You'll be wealthy and prosperous. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. 
You see how their blessing is contingent upon their obedience. But he goes on and says in verse 14, But if you do not obey me, and do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes, and if your soul abhors my ordinances, so as not to carry out all my commandments, and so break my covenant, I in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption and fever that shall waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also you shall sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies shall eat it up. There is a flip side to the covenant. If they do not obey, there are serious ramifications for the people of Israel. In Deuteronomy 28 we read, Now it shall be if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you will obey the Lord your God. But it shall come about if you will not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all His commandments and His statutes with which I charge you today that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. If, if, if. Deuteronomy 30. Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand in the offspring of your body and in the offspring of your cattle and in the produce of your ground. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good just as He rejoiced over your fathers if you obey the Lord your God to keep His commandments and His statutes which are written in this book of the law. If you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. And finally, in Judges 3, verses 3 and 4, he talks about these five nations, the Philistines, Canaanites, Sidonians, and so on. And he says, they were for testing Israel to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers through Moses. And I could cite many, many more. It's always if you obey, if you keep the commandments, if you keep the covenant. See, when I asked Krista to be my wife, I didn't set any of those kind of conditions. In fact, what I said to her, I pledged to her, I vowed to her that I would remain faithful to her and we would be married until one of us is dead. When God married Israel, He did not say, till death do us part. He said, this covenant will be intact until such time as you disobey it. Until you break the covenant through disobedience. At that point, the covenant is broken and I will destroy you. I suppose one could argue that it was till death do us part. The day they disobey, he would put an end to them and they would be dead. But we have to understand this. If we're going to understand how the scripture speaks of Israel and God's relationship to her, we have to understand all of these blessings proposed were based upon the if. If they obeyed. If they kept the covenant. Which begs the question, did they keep the covenant? Did they obey? Did they do all that was required of them to stay married to God? And of course, the resounding answer of the scripture is no. Let me just read for you two passages that speak this very clearly, both from Jeremiah. Chapter 11, verses 6 through 8. The Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers in the day that I brought them up from the land of Egypt, even to this day, warning them persistently, saying, Listen to my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked each one in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought on them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but they did not. And in chapter 31, where God prophesies and predicts the new covenant that would come, 
He says, starting in verse 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. And again, I could cite many other passages where God pronounces over Israel the fact that they broke the covenant and disqualified themselves as being a holy nation and a kingdom of priests and his special possession. This breaking of the covenant by the Jews has a very dramatic illustration back in Exodus 32. And as a backdrop to 32, let me read the last verse of Exodus 31. It says, When God had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. Now these two tablets, of course, are the famous tablets of stone on which were written the Ten Commandments. You remember Charlton Heston holding those two tablets up. Those were the Ten Commandments. Here it is called the Tablets of Testimony. There's a reason why they are called the Tablets of Testimony. The Hebrew word that is translated testimony here is edut. And it means testimony or bearing witness in a courtroom setting, but there is a, a more nuanced definition that we find frequently in Scripture. And it connotes not simply bearing some uh, generic witness or, te or testimony, but specifically a testimony that is a reminder and or a warning. So what it testifies to is that there might be danger lurking if you do not do what you are supposed to do. And that is clearly what is being spoken of here when it talks about the tablets of testimony. They were testifying to the Jews that if they break God's covenant, God will destroy them. And we find this phrase, the tablets of testimony, throughout the Old Testament, especially in the Pentateuch. On these two tablets of stone were written the Ten Commandments, which in Deuteronomy 4.13 are specifically called the covenant God made with Israel. So in these two tablets of stone, Israel has the Ten Commandments, the documents of their covenant, and a testimony, a warning to them that they must not break that covenant. Well, that sets up chapter 32 of Exodus. And we are familiar with this story. Moses is up on the mountain receiving God's writing on the Ten Commandment tablets. And while Moses is up there, the people down in the valley below decide they're tired of waiting for Moses, tired of waiting to hear from God. They want a God they can see with their own eyes and touch with their own hands. And so they come to Aaron and they say, make for us a God that we can worship. And they begin taking off their jewelry. And Aaron takes the jewelry and creates out of it a calf. And the people of Israel bow down before this golden idol. And they say, this is our God who delivered us from Egypt. Well, God, of course, sees what's going on. And in verse 7, he says this. Go down at once for your people. Not my people. It's your people, Moses. Your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said... This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. 
The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. See what has happened there? Israel broke the covenant. God says, I am going to carry through with my promises. Step aside so that you do not get caught up in my wrath, and I'm going to destroy them. Well, because these people had treated Moses so well over the years and loved him so faithfully, <laughs> Moses decides to plead and beg with the Lord to forgive the people. Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, Oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Interesting, he doesn't say Jacob there. He calls him by his new name, Israel. Remember them, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm he said he would do to his people. Moses here goes before the Lord and he begs that he would stay his hand of judgment. But did you notice how Moses pled? Did you notice to what he appealed? He said, Lord, look, if you kill them, the Egyptians are going to think you are a harsh, mean, nasty God who just delivered the people out here so you could slaughter them in the wilderness. And remember, you promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give this land to their descendants. What is conspicuously absent in his appeal is an appeal to the covenant. He does not say, Lord, you promised they would be your own possession and a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Remember your covenant with Israel. Why does he not plead the case of the covenant? Because the covenant terms are clear. There is no room in the covenant for God to withhold his hand of justice. The covenant demands that God destroy them. They have broken it. Moses knows that. And he says, because you're a gracious God, because you want to protect your name from being blasphemed among the Egyptians, because of your promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's where he pleads his case, but he does not appeal to the terms of the relationship with Israel. Verse 15. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Remember the testimony? They are tablets of warning. Tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. So Moses and Joshua come down and they hear the singing and dancing and realize there's a party, there's great revelry going on here. And he understands what they're doing. They are celebrating, worshiping this idol. And the scripture says he would, became angry and he threw down and destroyed those two tablets. What just happened? Was Moses a man of a hot temper that couldn't control himself? That when he saw this, he, it didn't matter what he had in his hand, he was going to throw it down and, and demolish it? No. This was not an outburst of uncontrolled rage. 
by breaking the symbols of the covenant God had made with Israel, he was displaying in very graphic ways that Israel had demolished the covenant with God and that they in turn would be destroyed. I don't think this was a flash of a hot temper. This was a very symbolic representation of what was going on. This covenant is now shattered, just like these stone tablets have been destroyed. So what was God going to do in response to this? Was it going to turn aside and say, you know all those stipulations I gave you and all those laws and, and the terms I gave you that if you break my covenant, I will destroy you. Forget it. That was just an idle threat. No. The rest of the Old Testament and even crossing over into the New Testament finds God keeping his promises. God kept the covenant. He did destroy Israel, but he didn't do it immediately. But eventually he did. And God alerted Moses that this was going to be the case. Look at verse 30. On the next day, Moses said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement of, for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. And if not... Please blot me from your book, which you have written. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. He withholds his anger for a time because he has a purpose. But God does not say in any way that he would fail to keep his end of the bargain. He would destroy them. Notice what he said, in the day that I punish, I will punish them. And every one of them that broke my covenant, I will blot them out of the book. I will destroy them. He did not simply look past and forgive them. The covenant with Israel had a beginning. It had very clear terms. It also had a very clear ending. When we come to the New Testament... We find repeatedly statements about the end of God's covenant with Israel. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, after the writer has quoted at length Jeremiah 31 about the new covenant that God would make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, in verse 13, the writer says that the old covenant, the covenant with Israel through Moses, is obsolete and ready to disappear. That word obsolete means it's old, it's worn out. It was used in the Old Testament of worn out clothes and bones that were wasting away and fruit that was lying on the ground rotting. That was the status of the Old Covenant when the writer of Hebrews wrote this book. It's worn out, it's rotten, and it's ready to be completely done away with. It's fading off into the sunset. It's done. And in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, writing to this group of Christians who are being bombarded by Jews, trying to bring them back to the old covenant system. And Paul there says to the Galatian church, when God made promises to Abraham, and then 400 years later the law came, the law could not undo what God had held out to Abraham. Well, the Jews would have responded with the question, well, then what was the point of the law? 
if this all is contingent upon Abraham, why did God make the covenant with Israel? And Paul says, it was a tutor, a disciplinarian. It was like a fence put around the people to keep them in tow until such time as Messiah would come. And then he says, now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. That disciplinarian is out of a job. It's done. As our Lord pronounced from the cross just before he drew his last breath, it is finished. He had come and fulfilled the Old Testament law, the Old Covenant law. He had taken upon himself the curse that Israel deserved so that all, that who, be all who believed in him would not experience the curse of that covenant. And then he died. And the old covenant died with him. It's over. And we should thank the Lord every day of our life that the old covenant is over and that we are not under that covenant. Because if we were under that covenant, this word would still apply. If. If we keep the covenant, then God will bless us.